Thank you, uh, Professor Liu, for the very kind introduction, and also that for the organizing committee for the invitation. I have to confess that uh, the invitation came in before the COVID-19 outbreak, so the title was Bad Viruses and the Next Outbreak. Now, I think that uh, it's more appropriate today, I should change the title to Bad Virus, the Current Pandemic, and the Next Outbreak. So I will cover both. So this is a very brief outline. First of all, I will start with kind of uh, defining the emerging viruses, the difficult cat categories from the unknown unknowns to the known unknowns, and then to address why bats are such a good reservoir for the emerging bat borne virus. Now, I know it's controversial. We're still in SARS-CoV-2, but I think we have to be ready. The pandemic preparedness is a very currently very popular and a hot topic, so let's get ready for SARS-3. Issues with the current vaccine or challenges with the current COVID-19 vaccines. Lastly, I will provide some hope. We have made some discoveries, maybe point a way to a novel vaccine strategy that can help us fighting the current virus and the future variants, and even maybe SARS-3. So I start with, you know, my really kind of uh, liking of this. When this quote first came out by Don Rothfield, the former Defense Secretary, really in the context of fighting terrorists. And he basically says, you know, there are the known knowns, which is easy, then the known unknowns, which is a bit more difficult, and then you have the unknown unknowns, which is almost impossible to predict. I think that there's huge similarities between virus and terrorists, and we are in the stage of dealing with known unknowns, but are we able to deal with unknown unknowns for another disease X? So personally, I consider myself fortunately that I was not trained as a virologist or infectious disease person. I was trained as a biochemist. Accidentally, I got a job to working on viruses in 1990. And then four years later, when I was in Australia, I co-discovered and named the virus Hendrovirus. That was the first bat-borne lethal virus jumping out of bats. And ever since that, you know, we had Nipple virus closer to home here. And then SARS, of course, the SARS-1 in 2003, followed by MERS, you know, 2012, West Africa Ebola 2014, and now COVID-19 in 2019. So I was involved, you know, to a certain degree in all of these six, especially the first three and the current one. So four of the major pandemics that I play a, a role there. And not only the time, right? Temporarily from, you know, uh, the last 25 years, we had a major outbreaks of zoonosis from bats, but also that the, time, uh, the geographic locations. So it started Hendrovirus 1994 in Australia, and then we had 98, 99, you know, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, the Nipper virus. And then we had uh, SARS in Southern China, SARS-1. And then we had a MERS, Middle East, and we had Ebola in West Africa. And then 25 years later, it came back to Asia, and this time is in central China in Wuhan. So basically no place is safe in terms of, uh, you know, pandemics. The other thing is the field, bats and the viruses really have grown, you know. Hendra virus was discovered 1994 in Australia, but we took us about a year and a half, 96, we really nailed down to say the virus actually originate from bats. You know, the virus origin is a hot topic right now, but I can tell you all virus origin research are retrospective. The best we can do is within two years, we identify the origin of uh, hangar virus from bats, 1996. And you look at the PubMed publications, you know, a few publications per year on that topic to last year, you know, you have hundreds of publications. I think this year is still climbing up. So the field has evolved just like the viruses. So, without any doubt, bats are now very important reservoirs of viruses. And as Professor Liu you know, mentioned in the introduction, they also carry this deadly virus without suffering any disease. Why? Why bats are such a good reservoir? Of course, this is a very interesting topic, but it's not the focus of today. So I will go through very quickly, just to you know, introduce to those of you who are not familiar with that, bats are the only flying mammals, and uh, these are the three facts during flight that bats can do, and we human can only dream of this. Their metabolic rate can be 
really raised to 30 times of their base rate, and their heartbeat can go to 1,000 beats per minute, and their body length, uh, temperature can go to all the way to 40 degrees C. All of this, I think, will be lethal to human. You know, we cannot tolerate that. So bats obviously need to evolve to tolerate that. And so that's, I think, the reason that why bats are such a good reservoir. Bats do not evolve to carry virus. Bats evolve to adapt to flight. And in order to adapt flight, they have developed a very unique defense system. The key is on the balance. We all know that, you know, whether you're human or bats, you have the defense system is essential to defend yourself. But when the defenses go overboard, like your inflammation system, your interference system go overboard, that's where disease happens. So bats are much better in get the balance right. So we had this, uh, you know, a nature review just came out early this year. So for those of you who want to learn more detail, I'm not going to go through this. And it's beyond infectious disease. As I said, you know, bats evolved to adapt to fly. So we can learn lessons from bats way beyond infectious disease. So this is another mini review just came out in a journal of experiment medicine, if you're interested. Basically, we can use bats as a model to study cancer, diabetes, aging, and you name it, even cardiology. Okay, so are we ready? for the next disease X, although we still have not got out the current one. So I'm a very conservative scientist. Usually I don't do predictions, but after MERS 2012, and I just came to Singapore at that time, Street Times, the journalist, science journalist in the newspaper really pushed me hard, asked me to predict. So I made a mistake of predicting it. You know, I said, you can bet it. I'm almost certain that in the next 10 years, there will be another killer virus from bats. Now, as a scientist, you know, if you make a prediction and it's proved to be right, you should be celebrating. But unfortunately, in our profession, if you predict right, the society suffers. So we got it right with COVID-19. And then I can assure you now, it's not a fluke because for the last, you know, five, 10 years, we have been prepared for another coronavirus. Uh, so this is a grant you apply in uh, 2016 and it's on combating SARS most like virus. And even in 2019, we wrote a review and it came out online just seven months before COVID-19. And in the discussion, we say that among the known unknowns, remember I opened it up by the known unknowns, that the bat coronavirus is really the one that we need to watch out. So that's seven months before COVID-19, okay? So if you look at the coronavirus family tree here, you have the alpha, beta, delta, and gamma. Unfortunately, they use the same letters to indicate the, the genus. So we have four genera in the family, and the beta is the one we need to watch out because that's the one contain all the emergent zoonotic coronaviruses, uh, including SARS-1, SARS-2, and the MERS coronavirus. But SARS-1 and SARS-2 is even more dangerous. They fall into this subgenus called the Sarbaco virus. And many of these viruses can use the now very famous, the human ACE2 molecule as a receptor. And the ACE2 molecules are highly conserved among animals and humans, and very highly expressed in our bodies. Okay, so these are the viruses to watch out. So what, you know, if you want make me to make a prediction again, I will not do it, but I will predict that if SARS-3 comes out, it most likely to be another Sarbaco viruses. And unfortunately, where we are is a hot zone because the bat diversity is the greatest in Southeast Asia. Actually, you know, we don't need to predict it. We already have evidence. So this is a preprint currently under review in Nature. Not my work, it's a work from a Pasteur Institute in Laos. They already discovered a virus that had a receptor binding domain identical to the current SARS-CoV-2. Now, for those of you, you know, not familiar with receptor binding domain, you must have seen this diagram on the top left, you know. So this is the computing enhanced image of the SARS-CoV-2. What you see on the triangular sort of red protein is the spike protein. At the bottom is the genome and the protein is in codes. The spike protein is the key protein that, you know, is the basis of the vaccine we have been taking, right? Whether it's mRNA vaccine or, you know, other vaccines. In the spike protein, the most critical area is what we call the receptor binding domain. So that's protein 
domain is around 240 amino acid, and it makes a direct contact with the receptor. So in this paper currently under review from uh, Laos, they discover a backbone virus that has an identical almost that receptor binding domain and the phylogenetic. If you put on the phylogenetic tree, as you can see, the top are all the human isolates originally from Wuhan or from other places. The next, the four are backbone virus. I mean, you, for those of you uh, following the origin of the virus, you know, there's a red G13 discovered by the scientists in China. That was the closest virus to SARS-CoV-2. But now we have virus much closer to SARS-CoV-2. So the key findings is that now we have identical IBD of SARS-CoV-2 with only one or two amino acid change, a live virus, I have to stress, a live virus. You know, for us virus hunters, most time we only detect sequences. To isolate live virus from bats is very, very difficult. But this time the scientists in Laos were able to isolate a virus that has almost identical IBD. It can, the virus can infect any human cells and can be neutralized by COVID-19 serum. So this, you know, from a serological point of view, it's SARS-CoV-2, no difference, okay? And that if you look at that, you know, with all the lockdowns the last two years, scientists like myself, we still try to foster international collaborations and we achieve a lot. In the last 18 months, we have discovered SARS-CoV-2-like coronavirus in bats and in pangolins. And it all the way goes from, you know, in the north in Japan to in China, Zhejiang province, the southern Yunnan province, cross the border to Laos, go further south to uh, uh, Cambodia and uh, Thailand. So we can bet that once the border opens, the international collaboration starts, we will discover many, many of the viruses similar to SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-1. And I think SARS-CoV-3 will be in that class of virus. So the reason we still have this conference, you know, with very few people in this audience is that uh, because of the challenge we're facing with reinfection of vaccine breakthrough infections. You know, so I'm going to present two stories, you know, uh, the first of us Israel story, right? Israel just a few months ago, you know, was uh, really acclaimed as the best vaccinated, best successfully vaccinated nations. So by May and uh, June this year, they already have 62% coverage and they use 98% of the mRNA Pfizer vaccine one of the best in the world. And they achieved what the, the Pfizer company really got the data from phase three, almost 95, 94% protection against you know, infection or disease. But that only go to June. And from June on, that dropped very, very rapidly. I think one of the reasons is that the longevity of the protection did not last as long as we thought or we wished. So that's the Israel story. Then we have the South Africa story. It's a different story. South Africa have gone through three waves of SARS-CoV-2 sort of uh, uh, infection. And the first was that 614G, we call it, it's almost like the parental virus. And the second wave was the beta, and the third was delta. So how can have a nation that have already gone through the two waves and then totally wipe out and replace by delta? The reason is that we now know the protect immunity for coronavirus is very virus and down to strand or variant specific. So that's a new challenge. So in terms of protect immunity, there was a lot of debate about which one is more important, neutral antibody or the T-cell immunity. My diplomatic answer is both are important. And uh, on practical level, that neutral antibody is easier to measure. But this paper, I think, is a milestone that published uh, uh, in Nature uh, Medicine basically said neutral antibody is a very good predictive uh, biomarker of uh, protecting, uh, protection against SARS-CoV-2. So this is on y axis, on the x axis is the level of neutral antibody. They define the convalescent serum, this is the blue dot, as one. And the vaccine serum, then they quantify this as, you know, one, four, two, four, three, four, 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 better. And then on the left, you know, you have the vaccines that are actually produce neutral antibodies lower than the recovered convalescent serum. On the Y axis is the protection against infection and the disease. As you can see, there was a good correlation. 
Although neutral antibody is easier to measure than T cell immunity, traditionally it's still very complicated because SARS-CoV-2 is a biosafe level three agent. So you need to have a BSS-3 lab. You need to have very experienced uh, uh, scientists to do that because the red out is a CPE, cytopathic effect. And it's not very quantitative, very expensive. There's a safety issue and takes three to five days. So very early on that our lab went in to invent something called a surrogate virus neutralization. It was uh, 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 basically is about chemical simulation of the virus neutralization. So virus neutralization on panel A, that you mix your test zero with the live virus, and then you incubate for you know, 30 minutes and you put onto the susceptible cell. And if that the virus can enter and cause CPE, then it's uh, negative in neutral antibody. Otherwise it's positive. On the right panel B, we did a simulation. We cloned and engineered the protein, both the receptor, the ACE2, also the spike protein, as I said, RBD protein, basically. And uh, so we did a biochemical simulation. Now we have a test you can run in a BSA2 lab uh, within like 30 to 60 minutes, and you get much more reliable quantification and the reproducibility. So to to demonstrate the utility of this assay, of course, you had to uh, compare to the gold standard. So the, on the x-axis is the pre reduction neutralization test used the live virus. On the y-axis is the surrogate virus neutralization, the commercial name is CPAS. As you can see, the concordance is uh, uh, 0.95, so it's very good. And the kit was uh, launched in Singapore May 15th last year and uh, got FDA approval six months later. Okay, so we have pushed this now to the next really stage of converting this uh, uh, single plex CPAS assay to a multiplex surrogate virus neutralization test. Why? Because we want to be able to compare the immune responses against the variants. Because the last year we did not worry about variants, and then by May this year we had so much trouble with the variants. So we convert this to a multiplex surrogate virus neutralization and use magnetic piece. We made the three changes. Now we put the liquid phase, you know, uh, IBD on the beads and the, the receptor in the liquid phase. So, so we convert that and we biotinylate the IBD so that the conformation is maintained. And more importantly now in the same tube, we can have assays to go to 10, 16 different subacral virus. So the in-tube competition make the assay have a higher uh, power to differentiate the immune response against different variants, okay? So we strategically chosen not only the SARS-2 clay, the clay-2 virus on top, but also at the bottom in the shared region is the SARS-1 clay, okay? And later I will show you how important it, that is. So this now is to really to demonstrate the utility and power of this multiplex system. So the left panel is serum from com all convalescent serum. The left panel is from the original uh, parental strain, and the second is the beta strain, and the third is the delta. So as you can see that, uh, you know, the first panel, you get the uh, best against white type followed by alpha, delta, and the beta. The second is best for beta and followed by this, and the third is best for delta. I mean, this is all known from the live virus uh, uh, neutralization, but we just demonstrate using the uh, SVNT is much more efficient. You can do many more samples. And also that you realize that the parental strain actually is uh, antigenically more closely related to beta and the delta, and beta and the delta is more separated against each other. So if we go like develop a, a vaccine against beta, actually we will suffer more now because the delta is the uh, a, a more uh, prominent strain. Okay, so challenges for COVID-19 vaccines are in three. One is the longevity we demonstrate already, Second is the breadth. We also demonstrate, right, because the vaccine is very effective against the parental strain, but less effective against beta and the delta. The last is really the location of immunity or protection, which is mucosal immunity. So we need to improve in all three areas, really, to achieve the dream vaccine, if you like. You know, so the dream vaccine is what we are aiming for. But I said, you know, dreams comes in generations, just like our mobile phones. You know, we had the 1G to 5G now, right? So the 1G, the first generation vaccine is what we got according to the original parental strain. The second generation vaccine 
people were developing against the variants, but now I think most people want to give up because uh, it's very dangerous to develop a vaccine against the variants. As I illustrate, if you have a vaccine against beta, we'll be in more trouble right now than the original vaccine. The third generation is we go to target all the sub virus in the subgenus, and the fourth generation is all the beta coronavirus, and the fifth generation is all coronavirus. So I'm as ambitious as the third. We are developing a third generation to, uh, you know, against all sub viruses. So I'm going to finish my talk actually with this uh, recent publication, but instead of going through the data it's already published, New England Journal was kind enough to make a video for our paper. And I found that they did a much better job than I can explain. So I'm just going to play their video for two and a half minutes to finish my talk. SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 belong to the species SARS-related coronavirus and the subgenus Sarbecovirus, but are in two distinct phylogenetic clades. Emerging SARS-CoV-2 variants pose a challenge to the effectiveness of current vaccines. A vaccine capable of controlling current SARS-CoV-2 variants of concern, as well as preventing infection by other Sarbecoviruses, would be optimal. To investigate the possibility of cross-clade boosting of neutralizing antibodies against Starbecoviruses, investigators obtained serum specimens from eight long-term survivors of SARS-CoV-1 infection who had received the Pfizer-BioNTech mRNA SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. Surrogate virus neutralization tests were performed to analyze the specimens for neutralizing antibodies against 10 different Starbecoviruses, seven from the SARS-CoV-2 clade and three from the SARS-CoV-1 clade including variants that affect only animals. The authors examined five serum panels consisting of specimens from unvaccinated SARS-CoV-1 infection survivors, unvaccinated patients with SARS-CoV-2 infection, healthy vaccinated persons, vaccinated survivors of SARS-CoV-2 infection, and vaccinated survivors of SARS-CoV-1 infection. All vaccinated survivors of SARS-CoV-1 infection had high levels of neutralizing antibodies against both SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2, including several variants of concern. These patients were also the only group with a broad spectrum of neutralizing antibodies against all 10 Sarbecoviruses, including bat and pangolin viruses with the potential to cause human infection. In this study, high levels of neutralizing antibodies against a broad range of Sarbecoviruses, including both SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2, were detected in survivors of SARS-CoV-1 infection who were immunized with a SARS-CoV-2 mRNA vaccine. Further study is required to see whether other combinations of antigenic stimulation from different Sarbecoviruses might be able to elicit broad immunity to the entire subgenus. Full study results are available at NEJM.org. All right, so I think this really demonstrates two very important lessons there. One is that uh, you have to think really outside the box, you know, in, in your career and in your science, you know. So I was fortunate enough, you know, uh, uh, be in Singapore so that thanks to the SARS survivors, you know, they volunteered and the collaboration scientists, clinicians. Uh, so that's very important. The second part, I think, of my career is that, uh, you know, I used to work in the animal health field and then got really interested in one house. And nine years ago, I came to Singapore and now we are really working in that one health domain. Even for the, 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 the animation, you know, we have this uh, bat virus, the pangolin viruses. So I always have a conscience that not only look at the human pathogens, you should look beyond and get into the animals. So in that context, I like to do a plug because we are very proud that we won the bid to attract the seventh World One Health Congress to Singapore exactly 12 months from today. So I hope by then we have more people can attend in person and many of you can come to uh, our conference. And then this is my group, you know, photo that uh, 23 months ago, we had the last Christmas party before COVID-19. And uh, the team members were very happy without realizing that, you know, in two months time, they had to work days and nights without holidays for the next, you know, 20 months. You know, so I thank my team, really appreciate. Last but not least, you know, this is what I really enjoy now in Singapore. I have very close collaborations with lots of clinicians, lots of scientists, and then we even collaborate very closely with our commercial partners. 
and uh, CPAS uh, kit, you know, is the first FDA approved uh, test kit for neutralization. And from the concept, we had the concept to patent to paper, to prototype, to regulatory approval, to marketing, 70 days. And I think that it can only be achieved, you know, in Singapore, I think, you know, so I'm very proud and with all the collaborations. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention.